author, a producer, CEO of Urban Visions Entertainment, and most importantly, or one of the most important things, not only is he a father of three boys, but he is the husband of Kelly Jarnett. Another. Jarnett. Did I say it wrong? Jarnett. It's fine. Jarnett. What did I say? Jarnett. Jarnett. You know what? I can't read my own handwriting. I <laughs> apologize. Well, Kelly Jackson, too. How about that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> so another awesome actress, um, Emmy nominated. Like I said before, I call you guys a dynamic duo of acting. Um, so next time you guys got to bring home those Emmys, though, okay? We need at least two. We're going to speak that yeah. into existence, all right? Absolutely. So you, and me, you guys may have seen Melvin on The Wire. You may have seen him in the New Edition movie as Curtis Blow. You may have seen Melvin walk in the streets. You may have seen Melvin wherever. But the point is that Melvin is here with us today. So thank you, Melvin, for joining us to talk about Juneteenth. And just we're going to talk about life. How about that? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So the first reason that I brought you here was to talk about Juneteenth. But before we even get into Juneteenth, let's get to know Melvin Jackson. Um, with all that's mm -hmm. going on in the world right now, Say again. I'm sorry, Melvin Jackson Jr. You can see this is his show. I'm just here, okay, guys, at this point. <laughs> but I, you guys have to understand, Melvin and I go back to high school. Um, and so this is not just me having a discussion or having an interview with a celebrity. This is me having a discussion with family. So we're going to be real candid. We're going to be real laid back. We're going to be, but you guys are going to get the point as well. We're going to do some things. So, Melvin, let's talk about um, what's going on today, man. Let's talk about why in the world are we in the state that we're in right now? What's going on in the world? Hmm. I think what's going on is that um, we've become too comfortable in um, our environment and just, just life. I mean, we just kind of forget about lives that we're taking uh too soon lives that we're taking uh without care and we didn't continue to hold people accountable for changing a system that that was some people say it's not broken um some say it was never in our favor i say a system that it was broken because in, the system is supposed to be created to benefit everybody not just one individual person or a group of people so a system that is broken that it has been broken and now it's time to continue it's like we're trying to fix the the dam that's been had a leak for for many years and now the, the dam has has broken open so that's what happened with us we were that leak that, that you continue to try to put put a you know a plug in it to, to to seal it and the floodgates are open now we're we're at a point to where now it's like we need justice we need to continue to keep the dialogue going about the injustice and not just turn a blind eye when we feel like we get some kind of justice or things have some have changed we got to make sure that things change all the way, you know, so that we are considered equal and not just something that people say. So let me ask you this. Do you think that, you know, you and I, we have had, um, we both had to research what Juneteenth was because, you know, throughout our lifetimes, we may have heard of it, but we really, it doesn't really get the, the, um, the accolades that it wants did maybe in previous years, you know, previous centuries or what have you. So I had to also research it as well, you know, to really get an in-depth. I've heard of it. I've attended festivals, right. but what is this thing called Juneteenth? You know, right. June 19th, what is that, right? In the wake of what's going on, you know, we know the Juneteenth is a celebration of when the last slaves were freed from Texas. Right. Um, so do you think that Juneteenth is actually going to be overshadowed or kind of demised by what's going on now? Or is it running parallel and still symbolic? I think it's it's right now it's running parallel in a sense because, um, you know, like I said, the whole thing of slavery is is people have still that slave mentality mm -hmm. where they they will continue to allow the people to um, put put them beneath them, like where feel, feel when people feel like other uh, races are, are more um, superior, and it's like it shouldn't be that way. That's how it was in the beginning where we also had slave owners where they were they were superior to 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 the um slaves and it was like they were filled afraid when it was quite it was even it was more slaves than it was um you know owners but because they felt that so inferior they didn't feel the courage to all get together and be like you know let's let's take over and so we're at a point to where 
some people are still walking around in shackles because they have this slave mentality where they don't want to say too much. They don't want to, to, to do certain things. And I think now it's time to, that people have started to break those, those chains free. So we're like, you know what, we, we are treated like, you know, um, we're mistreated in a way that is not the way we should be. So it's once again, we're put in that slave mentality where people feel like we should keep our mouth shut and we should just be happy that we have what we have. Um, and it's just like, that's, that's not the, the case anymore. Now when people are marching, black, white, Hispanic, all races are now coming together um, you know, Asians, like, all all different races are, and and that and ethnicity are coming together now for this this cause because they also see the injustice that has been caused um, by police, by by you know by people you know racism, and so we're just at a point to where it's just like no no more. So June 19 is now going to be even a greater celebration because we continue to remind ourselves how free we are. We have the freedom of speech. We have the freedom to protest. We have the freedom of assembly. Like all these things that we have the freedom to do, that we have to remember that we are free, that we are um, our people. And we have to continue to, to live out our, our voice. Be respectful, of course, but we still have to make sure that we our voices are heard and we don't let it, to, we don't get overshadowed anymore. You know, I was sitting here, and I have to be honest, I was listening to you, but... Um... When you were saying about uh, just keeping our voices being heard and everything, I just remind, I was reminded of a character that you played as a bully. <laughs> and so on Everybody Loves Chris, and I'm sorry, Everybody Hates Chris, excuse me. And so I was just thinking about, you know, that bully mentality as you were speaking. So I'm sorry, I did have a brain break for a second, but I wanted to get back and kind of come back to the point where you were saying about um, us being free or people being free. Right. And we were talking about, um, or you were mentioning about the fact that, you know, you are a husband and I know that you are a father. Right. So being a father of three black boys or three African-American boys, however, you know, the world wants to categorize them and you can clarify, you know, as well. How, what are your thoughts when they get up in the morning and they're getting ready to face the world and you being a black man, you know, being the son of a black man, which we'll discuss in a few seconds. But what are your thoughts as they go and face the world? You know, do you ever have fear or are afraid that, you know, I don't want to, you know, speak it, but what are your thoughts on that? I don't have the fear. Um, my, my thing is, I, I think it's one of those hard conversations to have to understand that, that, you know, you could um, be treated differently because of the color of your skin and don't think that you, will be treated the same way as your other counterpart. Like you may have, you know, Caucasian friends and understanding that if you're doing something and y'all get caught, you're most likely gonna take the blame for it because that's just how society is. And that's what we've heard where you see, you know, other ca Caucasian counterparts will put something on an African-American. So it's like, you have to understand like, just, just, just make sure that you're not out there getting in trouble. If you see somebody doing something to get in trouble, you go the other way because you don't have the luxury. Unfortunately, it's just this way the world is. You don't have the luxury because we're gonna be looked at a certain kind of way, but also understanding that you still have a right. You know, be respectful, but understand you still shouldn't be in fear of someone mistreating you because of the color of your skin. Like that's not how you should go about life. And I think that sometimes we, you know, with kids being blended and things happening, that you know, African American young kids now they don't look at society as crazy as it is because they're, they're shielded from it. And so, so many instances, you almost kind of can't shield them from it because when it happens, it shouldn't be a shell shock to them. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it has to be like, this is a real situation. Mm -hmm. Understanding that you don't have the luxuries of the other races. That's just what it is. Unfortunately, we'll have to eventually get past that, but that's just what it is right now that we're facing this constant black, it was black eye that you're receiving that just hasn't gone away. You know, um when you were saying about the black guy and not living under a spirit of fear, I believe that, you know, if we do, I, I believe that a lot of what's going, going on right now in the world is because of fear of the unknown. We don't know what to expect. You know, you don't know if, you know, if you leave the house, if you're going to be pulled over, if you're going to be searched, if you're going to be questioned, you don't know anymore. Right. And that I, I, a lot of people say that it's, you know, not just black people, but I am surrounded by black people. I have, you know, been a, a part of situations where I've been pulled over, questioned, you know, all those other bad things. I don't want to say good things. 
Right. Um, but here's the thing. Um, my concern is that, you know, we are doing a lot of protesting. We are doing a lot of movements. Um, how do you feel about the way that we're protesting, the way that we're speaking out? You know, when I say we, I mean people in general. I don't want to just say black people because right. as we see at a lot of these marches, it's very diverse. It's not just black right. people, white people. It's all races are coming together, you know, regardless of background. So how do you feel about how we're, how people are responding and you know, participating in these protests and all that good stuff. How do you feel about that? I feel, I feel good. I feel like we have come together as not just a, a, a nation, but also a community, a world where you see all different, you know, um, countries protesting with us. Um, you see all different races protesting and it's not, it has to stop being just a black thing mm -hmm. where it affects just the black people. It should have, if you're a human being, this should affect you too, because that's not right. Right is right and wrong is wrong as they say. And so if you see something not being done the right way, you can't turn a blind eye to it because it doesn't affect your, you as a person or it doesn't affect you as a race. Mm -hmm. it, should, it should affect you as, as in your heart. It should affect you as a human being. Like, this is not right. To see a man have his knee put on, on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and his life being taken like that, like, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. For someone to, not, to force a daughter, a six-year-old daughter, to not have their father anymore, that's not okay. For a son to have, you know, that that is not okay. And so I love the way we're protesting. You know, the people who are looting and doing all this stuff that are not about the movement, that that needs to cease because that's not a, that's not helping. That's actually hindering, you know, us from continuing to grow because people still gotta now fix their business. We're already going through COVID nineteen, so people have already, you know, lost money because they haven't been able to function as a business and now here it is they're having to rebuild their 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 store or whatever and some people may not care they'll be like you know what at least i get the insurance money or whatever they may be and some people that's not the case they're like i'd rather have my business intact than have the insurance money because they spend their hard earned money especially if they're a black business they had to go through trials and tribulations to even get to that point so what you just did was you just set somebody back and that had and is and you're not even helping to move the cause because that doesn't it just shows mayhem when you look at the news you like you see buildings being burned you see cars being burned what is that that's mayhem and I understand that people are frustrated during those times it's okay those I say it's okay but I can understand those first day or so but for it to you now we're in what day six or day seven of the protest for it to still happen now no and you know, for you to have to get shot with a rubber bullet to stop you or do all these things. Like, I think now the police have, have now come to an understanding to where they're kneeling with the protesters. Now they're, mm -hmm. they're communicating. And that's the point. We want to continue the dialogue. We want to keep, continue to keep the dialogue open so that things are not missed. You understand what our cause is. We understand your position and we meet, meet in the middle. You know, one thing that concerns me a lot is that, you know, I do have a lot of police officer friends, you know, sheriffs, deputies, and I don't have these issues with them, you know, right. because we have relationship. And what I understand from us this, having discussions, they and myself, when they're outside of uniform and nobody knows that they hold a badge, that badge is in their wallet, they get the same discrimination and the same issues as those I'll say common folks or civilians. And so my concern is that, you know, um, being somebody who has a mental health first aid certification, I'm concerned about the violence that's going towards these people. You know, mm -hmm. when I say these people, the officers, the military, you know, law enforcement individuals, because I just feel that not only from the officer standpoint, but the trauma of this, you know, because this is something we've never lived through before. You know, right. other generations have, but we haven't. And so, you know, there, I, there's a, a concern with me. I'm not going to say fear. I got that from you. But a concern about PTSD, about, you know, some of these other things where we know that everybody has a breaking point. And, right. you know, then people, you know, it may be, unfortunately, some situations where it's just a matter of somebody snapping because they've been fed up and had enough. And that's on both sides. But what I wanted to talk about and kind of bring that into the fact that you are an advocate for mental health first aid and mental health issues right. and, and mental health awareness. And so I want you to kind of share a story. Let's take a pause from Juneteenth. Let's take a pause from 
the world's riots and uproar. And let's talk about mental health and why is it important to you to spread awareness about it? Absolutely. Um, definitely it's important for me to, to be an advocate for mental health awareness and uh, suicide prevention. Um, because in 2014, um, I lost my father, Melvin Jackson Sr., to uh, suicide. And it was just something that I never thought I would experience. And it was definitely eye opener because me and my father had a great relationship. You know, we talked all the time and we pretty much talked every day. And so for me to not even have a warning sign, when I said warning sign that that, that was where he was going, I knew that day when we talked that <clears throat> he was going through, through something. Um, but I didn't think that it would lead him to wanting to take, to, you know, take, take himself out. And so when I'm getting that phone, you know, the, but the last thing, we said to each other, you know, we after talking because he didn't mean to call me and I saw I had a missed call from him. So we started talking, talking about what was going on. And, and, you know, <clears throat> the last thing we said to each other was where we loved it. We, you know, told each other, we, I love you. And um, I was happy to be able to do that um, because some people don't get the say, chances to really say goodbye or talk to they, their parent before or whatever that may happen. So that situation allowed me to start caring more for people. And when someone's going through something, whether they're depressed or, Going through just something, I'm like, let's pray. Let, how can I assist? How can I be there if you just need me to, to listen, if you just need me to be there? Like, however I can do it, I feel like, you know, I can't save everybody. I don't want to be on this thing where I'm like, I'm trying to save everybody. I just feel like <clears throat> that's my job. That's not, that's God. That's not my job. My job is just to be a blessing and be a light wherever I go because we know there's a lot of darkness. And we've, you know, a lot of us have all been depressed. I've been depressed myself. And it's not a, it's not a good feeling to be in, especially alone. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to tell people when you're in that, that space so they can try to do whatever they can do. Because I think if you keep it to yourself, then you allow yourself to be in this dark hole. And we already know it's hard to get out of that dark hole. Um, and I remember one time, you know, being depressed and kind of going through a moment. And I just remember, you know, my, my son at the time, um, he was 17, 18. Um, and he was like, Dad, God got us. Because I was going through a financial situation. And he was like, Dad, God got us. And he just hugged me. And that, that just meant a lot for me because I feel like had I not told my son what I was going through, what, what was happening, it would have just been kind of like going about my day, walking around like a zombie. And so we have to just be open and honest and say we're in a bad spot. Like if sometimes they say, hey, how are you in the, are you in the valley? Are you in the peak? Or where are you at? You got to just um, vocalize that so people know. That's awesome. You know, I just want to commend you on being an MHSH, mental health superhero, um, because, you know, just the fact that you're able to share the story. And, you know, when I had first seen you, you know, talking about your father's passing, um, the strength that you had then, you know, even though you were going through your process, but right. you had strength then. And I believe that, you know, I always try to say that in, and I'm not going to call it a negative situation, but in, um, situations that we may believe or feel that are contrary to positive. There's mm -hmm. always a purpose. So I believe that your father's passing gave you purpose with mm -hmm. compassion, your relationship with God, just your heart for other people, your understanding. Just, there's so much. So mm -hmm. continue to celebrate his life because mm -hmm. he's not, even though he's not here physically, he's still living on. And just because you got some gold medals in track and some bronze in wrestling, those medals are good, but you're really a champion with being able to give back to the community and those who come in contact with you with that mental health issue or with those mental health issues. So I thank you for that being, you know, uh, even receptive because you could have turned your back and been like, I ain't dealing with it, you know, and then had your own. So because you're encouraging us to release or to breathe, it's actually helping us to be able to move forward. So thank you for that. Um, let's talk about the the rioters and the looters i know we kind of took a break from that and we were talking about um the fact that the, we're still we may be doing further damage by rioting and looting so give us some give us some melvin jackson on that i mean i think that what happens is we have to continue to learn chess figure out different moves and stop playing checkers because you feel like <clears throat> You know, looting, people have people out there for their own cause. They're just trying to, like, one guy got arrested the other day, yesterday, and they were like, you know, were you about the protest? He was like, yes and no. He was like, what were you trying to do? I'm just trying to get money. And so he's standing there handcuffed because they, they got him, and he's being interviewed by a reporter, 
And she, he's simply now he's using this as a message to, you know, hey, kids, if you're out there trying to get money, do it the right way. Don't do it legal, illegally because you'll see what's happening to me. And then the guy would end up let go with a, with a warning and a, and a fine because one that, that wasn't in with the, wherever the police were, where they arrested them, that wasn't in their area where they, you know, they, they had jurisdiction. So he got lucky, but it's just like other people you've seen, you know, I've seen people beating up owners of the store. One guy in my neighborhood, um, the looters came and said, hey, how are you? Uh, are you working today? Are you open? And he said, yeah. And then they came back with friends and hit, beat him up and try to break down the door. It's like, what are we doing? How, how, is, how is this solving anything? And it's the, and it's most of the young kids. And it's like, come on, y'all. Y'all got to be more smarter. This has nothing to do with you trying to get a, a, a leg up on somebody or, or you trying to get, get money or get whatever it is. You, you know, they're robbing, they're, they're uh, looting a pharmacy. And it's like, we just need people to think. Like we're out here protesting for, for a cause because someone's life has been taken and here you are taking advantage of a situation so you can get ahead. And it's like, what? What is this world coming to? So I, I don't, I don't res respect you know, what's happening because you're affecting other people's business that have nothing to do with the problem. Um, and now they have to rebuild. And it's just, I, I don't, I don't um, I'm, not, I'm not condoning it. In the beginning, it's like, yeah, you understand certain people are doing things. But now it's like, okay, you made your point. Mm -hmm. You made your point. Now we're in day seven. Mm -hmm. What's next? What you gonna do? You know, it's funny. I've actually been told that I wasn't black because <laughs> I actually, um, I don't condone, just like you, I don't condone the rioting and the looting. I condone voices being heard. And I understand, again, it's a gray area because I understand why, but I don't understand why. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is because I understand the reason behind all this. It's a boiling point. This had to come to a peak. You know, people mm -hmm. are tired of being tired. But when you're destroying businesses of fellow black owners, that's a problem because now you're taking from their family and their opportunities, right? right? Something that they may have fought hard for. If you're, you know, any business, any business owners, you know what I mean? It's a struggle to get a business. And then when you get it, to have it snatched from you for something that you're not even a part of, you know what right. I mean? And so that's not, it's not fair. And yeah. so I, I just don't want us to lose focus with all that's going on. And with that, um, you know, Juneteenth is coming up. And a lot of the events and things that we normally would have had have been canceled due to COVID and everything else is going on in the world. You know, we can't have mass gatherings, all that kind of stuff right now. Yeah. Um, how important is it to you that we still celebrate Juneteenth? It's very important, definitely with the climate that we're in. You know, this is a prime example that we have to keep to you remember what our ancestors did before us and um, the luxuries that we do have that we didn't have before, the right to vote. So that's important. We have to make sure we vote. We have to change who are in, in um, office and the policies and the people who make the, the, um, the, the changes. We have to make sure that we change the people so they are not just for the people, but they're really for the people, you know, not just for a certain uh, sector of people or race of people. And we have to continue to remember that um, we won't be chained. We won't be, we won't be allow ourselves to continue to be handcuffed to what society has said that we're supposed to be mm -hmm. instead of being who, we're, who, who God created us to be. And that's equal. We can't just see, simply say these words, we're created, you know, created equal in his, in his, um, in his image. We all should feel that way, but there's some that don't. And we have to continue to start changing their, their perspective. We have to start changing people's viewpoints. But if you show them the, the, what they already, the image they already have in their head, then their, their point is proven. So we have to continue to change the narrative of what, what it is that we as Black people stand for and we want to be represented as. As a person, just yeah. not even as a Black person, but as a person. As a person. <laughs> you know, can we start with I, that? Right, the beautiful thing, right, the beautiful thing for me was I, I grew up, you know, I lived overseas for eight and a half years, and for me, color didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at color. Color wasn't a thing. People didn't look at me as a color. Like, I don't know if they, in their mind, they may have said them, but out, and, and they never said anything to me. So we were all looked to be equally, and it was just a beautiful thing where overseas, it's just all love. You know, when you get to the States, that's when the whole hatred and everything, because of your color, your skin, all these things, starts to, to, to be, uh, to start to happen. You know, one of the things that was um, important about Juneteenth is that 
you know, yes, like you said, it did free the slaveries, but it was something else that you, um, you and I had had a discussion before about the fact that being free, you still had to walk around with papers. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, it's like back in the days when, you know, or more back in those, those days of slavery, when people that were free, they had to walk around with their freedom papers to prove that they were free, almost like an ID. You have to walk around with your identification saying that I'm free and they still had the option. They still could, could, could capture you again. So it's, it's even though you're free, you still had an op you could have still been captured and put back in slavery. They didn't, it didn't care. So, you know, people walk around with their freedom papers, but they're not, they're not, they're not showing it. They're not re remembering like we are free and they have to continue to show their freedom papers and understand like we are free, we are proud, and we will not continue to take what's been given to us anymore. We won't take scraps. We won't take whatever you want to give us. We're going to take what's us deserving of us. We're going to take our portion. So it's like you can, people, they want to give us payment plans. They want to give us um, little, little, little bits and pieces here and there. It's like, no, we want our full payment now. We don't want to continue to wait. Mm -hmm. We don't want to continue to wait 30 more years to be like, you know, now we got a reparation. Mm -hmm. You know, no, we want it now. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, it's funny that you said that because even today in a lot of places, you can't go outside your house without your ID or you're not supposed to, you know. So that's technically like your freedom papers. Even those who are getting out of jail, they have to walk around with a piece of paper or their ID card from jail until they get an ID. So it's kind of still similar today, you know. Um, I kind of want to talk to you because you are somebody who has been seen on the big screen, who's been in movies, TV, et cetera, you know. And so um, I'm waiting for you to get your Hollywood Walk of Fame, but, you know, we'll wait room for that, too. We'll speak that into existence. But, you know, some people are calling out those who are on the forefront, meaning those who are in media, the Oprahs, the Michael Jordans, the Gales, um, saying that they're not doing enough for um, or speaking out enough. Um, being somebody that's on, I'm going to say, even though you're on our side too, <laughs> but being on that side of the camera, let's do it that way. Um, give us some insights or some, some views or perspectives on that. I think everyone's um, stance is different. You know, the, some people are speaking out in public. Some people are speaking out on social media. Some people are speaking, most people are speaking out with their, their pockets, where they're donating money to, for calls, where they are behind the scenes. I feel like everything doesn't need to be publicized. Mm -hmm. There's some people that, of course, need to speak out. There's people that are there. People are looking for them to speak out. Um, like you see, LeBron is very vocal. Certain people are very vocal. Jesse Jesse um, Williams is always very vocal. Um, those people you expect that from. There's certain people that you know they have other ways to to make a difference. And someone like Oprah, she has a way to make a difference because of the the people she employs, the people that you know that she affiliates herself with, the candidates that she's a. Um, so there's certain things that we know that pretty people do that we don't necessarily need you to, to vocalize all the time. There's people, of course, we want you to vocalize if that's your thing, but I'm not going to call somebody out because they haven't been vocal. It's everybody's, like I said, everybody can do it in different ways. Everything can be, you know, someone can be, like I said, behind the scenes meeting with these people behind closed doors trying to change policy and actually making a difference. And there's some people like you see a Reverend a Jesse Jackson or Al Shopton who are always out there with the you know on the on the front line protests and that's that's their that's their cause that's their thing that's what they do, so I feel like you know we shouldn't call out people we should give them their their uh their just do and we just let them see and just see what they do and see, you know and if they don't do anything then that's something different but everybody does everyone's message is not going to be the same everyone's call is not going to be the same so I think everyone just has to kind of do your part and then let other people do theirs. Like if people want to call them out, cool, call them out. But you know, I was happy to see Michael Jordan spoke out. I think Oprah spoke out, but yeah, it's just, some people can speak out, but then it's like, what else are you going to do? So you can post something on social media or you can say something, but what else, what are you going to do? So I think it's, it's a, it's a bigger thing than when people can look at. It's, it's not going to be just people saying something. It's actually going to be actions and people listening. But you know, I, um, I was taking some time and I actually was thinking about it because I was one of those ones that said, hey, where's Jesse? Hey, where's Al? You know, and I think that naturally we look for somebody who's a leader, somebody mm -hmm. to take the lead role in any group, you know, communication right. and leadership. You look for that leader. Um, but I also, 
it's a question of are those people that we were you know just discussing and identifying not the jesse jackson and al sharpton's or even them too are they really obligated to say something are they really obligated to um you know make a public statement not really because like you said we don't know what you know you guys are doing behind the scenes you know you guys could be just um and it's not just but you guys could be you know sending out information you know it's just the point that i guess it, it shouldn't be us looking for validation when i say us meaning whomever's participating it should be us trying to come together and just do what we have to do you know and it's a thing where if they get you know they'll get criticized whether they get accolades in public they'll get criticized whether you guys get accolades in private so the bigger thing is just continue doing what you're doing with that you know i'm getting to a point where i'm going to put you on the spot that's my warning number one but before that um do you and your family have any plans of celebrating juneteenth anything spectacular that you guys are going to do um no just continue to celebrate uh you know freedom blackness and um continue to promote, promote the cause um i think that for us, you know, for, for me in general, like I, I don't, you know, sometimes when we have these holidays and we celebrate like, you know, where it's Mother's Day or whether it's Valentine's Day, it's like, I don't look at those one day as celebrating someone on that one day. So it's like for me, June 19th, yes, it's very important, but I'm gonna continue to celebrate that for the 365 days of the year, because it's something that, that just didn't, you know, wasn't one day that we were black, we were black every day. You know, we were, you know, we were always free, you know we were always free but we were physically we were captured and so to remember you know every day that we're free that's something to continue to put in our forefront and our minds that we're all we're, we're always free we have we you know we are free as long as we allow ourselves to be free until we do something stupid to now be put in, into captivity which is jail mm -hmm. so we continue to make sure that we, re we remember our freedom enjoy our freedom be smart with our freedom and use it for for the better good of our people so I gave you a warning. <laughs> and one of the reasons, not the main reason, but one reason that really drew me to even this conversation with you is the fact that we were on Facebook and you did a George Floyd monologue because ultimately, you know, there have been discussions about race and um, there have been discussions about police brutality, violence. There have been all these discussions before, but this one, with the murder of George Floyd, it seemed to take the world to another position, to another place mentally. And when I heard your monologue, I was like, wow, like during while you spoke, I was actually holding my breath, you know? And at the end, I was just like, it took me somewhere to the mindset as if I were standing there, right there beside Mr. Floyd standing right there beside George, because that's another thing, you know, the young lady who was videotaping Mr. Floyd, she's now being a victim of bullying and harassing. And just before we get to the monologue, um, we see a lot of people videotaping. We see a lot of people filming. And I've heard someone say, and I don't even exactly know who it is, so I can't quote it, but I'm just gonna paraphrase, that racism has always been there. It's just now we have cameras. Yeah. So, Let's talk about that for a quick second. I'm still giving you some time to get ready, right. but let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that, you know, it's crazy is that, you know, a lot of these cases would never been come, come to the light of day if they wouldn't videotape. But I feel like sometimes videotaping is not enough. We actually have to stop the crime from happening. You know, like Amar Arbery, you know, someone who could have stopped them and then wrote a letter, you know, at, the, at this, this the, the visual site saying, you know, I'm sorry, I wish I could have done, I wish I would have stopped them. But you didn't. I understand. Like these people have, have guns, and you know, I, I get in that that moment. But you're in a car too, so there's, there, you know, I mean, certain things like call the police, whatever you could have done. Um, but it should have took two months for a video to come out or for charges to to, to happen, and for it to someone to sit there and record, you know, Floyd, George Floyd, you know, being treated the way he was treated with a knee on his neck. Um, <clears throat> I, I I understand that some people are fearful for their lives, but you, would you what would you rather do have done something or not done something and then the result happened now you're faced with now you could have done something all you were able to do is record yes we're thankful for that you were recording but 
this person is no longer here anymore. And for eight minutes and 45, 46 seconds, like that's a lot to just sit there and just watch. I don't know if I could have done that. I would have had to risk my life in order to save somebody else. That's what other people would have done. There's people that are out there, you know, firefighters risking their lives going into a fire to save someone else's. That's what we do. That's what they do anyway. So I feel like if you're going to die for something, die for a cause that, that because you, you know, yes, in, in a crazy world that we live in, because of George Floyd, he, things are going to be changed. But things that already should have been changed. It shouldn't even came to this. It shouldn't have come for, for us to lose a great man like him, for a daughter to lose their father, for a son to lose their father. For us to be like, you know what? Now the world definitely needs to change. We've been saying this for so many years. For, for when your people are fearful to have to wear a hood, a, for wearing a hood on their head, because when Trayvon, Trayvon Martin was killed, like we we were like, oh, should I wear a hood because people are gonna think I'm trying to rob them or whatever? Especially at night, it's like as a black man, I shouldn't have to worry about that. But that's 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 what we're facing, and so we have to just continue to to not just videotape things, we have to actually start doing. And I think now that people are fed up and you're seeing they're fighting the off, they're fighting police and, you know, and it's not all police. It's just some bad apples, but those other police are just as fault because they're not, they're not chastising them. They're not correcting them, they're not stopping them because there's three officers that could have helped save this man's life. Mm -hmm. And another guy said, hey, should we turn him over? And they listened to the other guy and he said, no, or whatever he said, but you, have to be smart enough to be like, you know what, this is not right. Where will the, the, the compassion starts to happen? When you be like, you know what, this is not right, I don't feel it in my spirit. There has to be a, a, a switch that in you as is, is a person. That's, yeah, it's, it's, it's unexplainable. Like this is unexplainable. I mean, they don't come out with a conviction for all four of them. Then it's, it's really, we really got, we still got a lot of work to do, but it's really gonna be, Or something not men not to be found guilty. Yeah, we not we can't go with another acquittal because you know this this was not a, this had nothing to do with police. You didn't use your weapon. You use your knee as a weapon. Mm -hmm. So nah. Now, out of fairness, little brother, the young lady who recorded was only seventeen. So not saying that she didn't know right from wrong, but we got to kind of give her a little bit of a pass of not intervening. No, absolutely. Okay. No, and I'm not, okay. I'm not right. And I'm not just saying her, but there's other people that were there too. Because you hear right. other people too, and so that's just when a group of us got to come together. I'm like, hey, let's go over there. Let's put our hands up. Let's do what you know. Let's let's distract them. That's some kind of way to yeah. where he releases some. You know what I mean? I understand. Like she's 17. She's young. I'm not putting that on her. I'm just saying that there's people that that have the ability. If there's more than one person, I get it. If there's one person, and it's kind of like okay. But I, I would say me, I would probably be comfortable stepping in if it's multiple people because someone still has to capture this thing. Mm -hmm. And so if there's not someone cap even capturing you trying to intervene, now the, the, the narrative can be switched into something else. Oh, he tried to attack me too. Why he, that's why both of them did. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just all these things you still have to, I know in, in those moments, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're startled. And, I, and I've been through those moments where Remember somebody was trying to break into a mother's house one time, and I, you know, you 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 start you seize up because you're not knowing what's happening. But that one thing, once that one thing happens, it bet it'll change you the next time. So it happens again, you'll jump into action with, with the quickness because you've already been through that initial shock. Absolutely, I just wanted to have you back on that one, so somebody can't say you know right, blah right. blah blah about baby no, girl, you know. No, I appreciate, but, I appreciate that, not for sure. No, I always got you. But see, one of the things when um when I was thinking about, you know, just the eight minute situation or a little bit over eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, if you put a bag of microwave popcorn in the microwave, that takes two minutes approximately. You put a typical microwave dinner in the microwave, it's about five minutes. So now you're talking about something and then those items are cooked and you can conceive, you can eat them, right? You're talking about eight, over eight minutes of not only the pain, but the mental anguish of thinking this could be it. The frustration of not being able to fight back, even though he never did. According to the videos, he never resisted. Um, so I sit back and I think eight minutes to, is long enough to burn food in the microwave. And eight minutes was long enough to take a man's life 
for no reason. With me saying that, I want you to take us into the George Floyd monologue that you did. Hi, my name is George Floyd. You're hearing this because I'm no longer here. You already know the story of what happened. So let me take you back to the day of the situation. I woke up that morning being thankful to God for waking up. Decided I was going to go and buy some cigarettes. So I went to a store, got the cigarettes, and I paid for it. It's a $20 bill. The clerk says my $20 bill is counterfeit. So she decides to call the police. I said, okay. I go in my car and I wait. I wait for the police to come. They pull me out of my car, put handcuffs on me. One thing led to another, everything happened so fast. Next thing I know, I was laying on the ground. One officer had his hand up, his knee on, his, um, knee on my back. Another officer had his hand on my leg and another officer had his knee on my neck. I wasn't resisting. As I lay there on the ground, uncomfortable, with a knee on my neck, helpless. I begin to not understand why I'm in this situation. I see people videotaping, but no one's helping. Five minutes pass, and a knee's still on my neck starting to not be able to breathe. So I start to say, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And in total, I said this 15 times. And still, knee was on my neck. I can't breathe. 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 And yet still, the knee is still on my neck and the pressure has not been released. And it continues. I can't breathe. 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 And I find myself not able to breathe anymore. But before I lose all consciousness, I call out for my mother who's no longer here because I feel like I'm coming to join her. Two minutes and 46 seconds later, the knee is still on my neck. Even though I'm not moving, officer, ex-officer Derek still decides to keep his knee on my neck. Now imagine if I was white. This wouldn't have happened. Okay. As I take my breath and I exhale, I just want to thank you, Melvin Jackson Jr., whom I call my little brother, for taking the time out to have this real discussion, not only about Juneteenth, but about umpteenth in the world right now. So I thank you again. And we're going to look forward to them Emmys coming home. I'm talking about with an S for you and Kelly. And we just, again, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, DMV's own Melvin Jackson Jr. He's representing the DMV, y'all. So let's continue to support he and his wife and their families and any projects that they do because we know they're going to be successful. We thank you.
Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, little brother. Thank you. For real this time, we got it. All right. We said it to you, I got it. Uh, oh my God, I'm stressing. I'm <laughs> like, what in the world? So it's on the map. We know it's good this time. So, right, cool. but you need to record that monologue, man. Put some music to it. Right. I got to write it down. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was some stuff that I, I left out because I put in, in that, because it was just off the top. It was, I, I wrote down the time, the actual times, like when, you know, it was like two minutes and some change. Because I said, like, I, I said, it was like, remember these numbers. And I said the number, the times, and then I got, and went into those. And, um, and I was just like saying, like, I wanted people to have a visual to understand what he was going through that day. Because we leave out the house thinking that everything is going to be fine. Well, we didn't imagine that we would get uh, we would have all these different officers around us over 20 dollars that was a allegedly counterfeit right. and then it was kind of like who who you know will all these officers normally have come for counterfeit like it was so many officers it was like really and then you saw well, no, it was like what did she tell them what did she tell them and then that's the thing it's like it was a domino effect yeah as far as this all happened like who's talking about the the, the clerk this all happened because of her calling the police over a counterfeit that actually they say it wasn't even counterfeit. So it's like, there's a lot of wrong that's just happening. So it wouldn't even got to him being arrested. There being a videotape with all these things. So there's like a domino effect. that is just crazy that people have to be careful of what they're doing. They're calling the police on a black man, understanding what that, that is. It's almost a death sentence. You calling a, a, a you know, a, a, the police on a black man, it's, you, you're just almost still that man's, death or, or whatever may happen from that because something that isn't true. But you know what else is funny about it now? I was watching the, um, the news and everything because, you know, I'm monitoring everything. You know, I try to be that beacon that's sharing the live videos from across the country because I want people to see what's going on, right? And right. then the factual information, and I showed you the information about the two million person marks that they're planning. That they're yeah, working I on. That. It, it's, yeah. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all, I'm going to just say, eh, I watched, uh, yeah. I'm optimistic. I hope yes, but, yeah. See, but that, and that's what, and that's the crazy thing. Like the simple fact, it's like how, this. This is just crazy. Twenty twenty has been really interesting, um, because um, they say you know we talk about this clear vision. Yes, our vision is very clear right now of, of what actually what the problem is and what has happened and where it comes from the top, the president to everything else that's going on. And then you look at. Um, it's COVID-19, we're in COVID-19 phase, and then it was like, now we're having, to, people are having to protest in this, and we're already susceptible to this as Black people, you know, we already, you know, so it's like, wow, is this not a way to just, you know, to just wipe us off? Oh, um, out. But our, our, our other counterparts are out there with us, our, our white brothers and sisters, our Hispanics, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those things that if somebody said to, the other day, it was like, I don't care, they was like, yeah, I understand the COVID-19 is out, but this is more important, like, you know what I mean, like, and it's kind of, it's one of those things, it's kind of like, well, what am I not going to do? I'm not going to protest for my, my people because of COVID-19. So it's almost one of those things, like I said, you kind of have to not live in fear and just pray that God blesses everybody, that we don't have this massive outbreak. But this is important, you know, yes. and those that are willing to be out there. But I just feel like people still need to be smart about it. Put your mask on, mm -hmm. you know, you may not know about so, how much social distancing you can do in those moments, but just be, be smart and have your mask on at least. But no one's have like even the officers don't have their masks on. So, but um, use the use the the real mask, not the the little paper or whatever. Was getting yeah. them joints with the two nostrils. But you know what's really funny? You remember once upon a time people could not go into a store with a mask on, right? And now you have to go in with a mask on. So here it is once again. That stereotype has to be legated because now I have to come in your store. You know, you want yeah. my money. So I have to yeah. come in there with it. And then no mask, no service. <laughs> right. And see, here's the thing that I realized too. And then also, if you look at those businesses that were really closed down, closed down, mm -hmm. the nail salons, they got hurt. I can't get no eyebrows. I didn't pick my color. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a wrap. But you right. know, one thing that, you know, we all, I sat back sometimes and I was having a conversation with one of my, um, again, one of my colleagues. And we were saying, number one, the store owner is now going out saying that he wished he never called the police, okay? Mm. Because, but you got to remember, he was acting emotionally, erratically, and now all of a sudden you're trying to fix it up. Because now he's probably trying to flip it too because you're in fear. You don't know what people going to come and get you, you know, because of what you did. Right. And then we were saying how, you know, a lot of us have to be actresses and actors. 
because when we're at work, I can't be like, what's up, Joe? What's up? What's going on? You know, I got to have a, hey, how are you? How are you doing? You know, like the whole persona has to change, like an alter ego. So I have to be LaDonna at work, but then I can be Toya when I get home. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I just flip up the script. And so I think that's played like a really crucial part in just the overall lifestyle. But I think things are changing because yeah. now I'm seeing people use slang, Ebonics across the board. So it's no more just you have to do this to get the job. Right. You know, it's, and it's interesting you say it because it's like, you know, what people have said is that, you know, even I love, I forgot his name. He said something. He was like, you know, I cannot be about, not be about the cause when we love black culture, when we love the black music. He was like, I was like you know, first I, I want man to listen to it, maybe Rum DNC or whatever. It's like, you can't love the black culture, but not love the black people. You know what I mean? Like, the, it, you, it can't be both. You can't be like, Yes, I love such and such, but then when someone a black person can kill you, like, oh, that's not my cause. But you listen to our music, mm -hmm. you like you like the you know movies. I love so Drake, you know, right. <laughs> so it, it's, what I love about that is that people are like, you know what, I can't love the black culture and I love the black people too, and be for the people. You right. know, everybody is not okay. Like I say, everyone's cause is going to look differently, and I don't expect my my white uh, friends or counterparts to to do the same thing I'm doing or be more as militant mm -hmm. as I'm. That's not their their thing. There's some fact they support me, they still love me, mm -hmm. and they like, yo, we got your back, whatever you need. That's enough for me. You know, yeah. um, and everybody's got to do their part their own way. The one thing that I do like about the younger generation actually channeling some of that, I heard um, one of my friends, well, one of my associates, he used it, he used the word misguided passion. Don't try to steal it. I've already got it. Working on a book. Don't do it. But um, <laughs> what he was talking about was the fact that, well, what we were discussing is the fact that, you know, a lot of times young people don't have an avenue. They are creative. School bores them, you know. So what we think is really behavior issues is really, like me, I was a bad kid. I didn't want to go to school. I had other stuff to do because school didn't challenge me. You know, I had perfect on almost all the Maryland functional tests. You know what I mean? It wasn't a challenge. And my mom made it a point that even though we lived in PG County, I was going to Mo County schools, you know, mm -hmm. so that I could have that expanded broadness or whatever the case may be. But here's what happened. I purposely got kicked out of school. And I can tell her this now at 42 to make sure that I went to Fairmont Heights because that was my neighborhood school. Okay. She made me go to BCC. I had to go to Eleanor Roosevelt. I was like, no, I want to go to Fairmont. I want to be hood. I was told at BCC that I was not black enough to be on pom-poms because I couldn't dance like the black people. Okay? So all that, once that happened to me in ninth grade, I'm telling you, I cut my hair. I was, because my hair used to be down my back. I decided I was going to be the blackest black girl that is. Right. I couldn't be in love with new kids on the block anymore. <laughs> now I had to hear, no, Joe, I was going to marry Joe. I love, I, love, I love new kids on the block. That's what I'm saying. I told you, I mean, listen, I'm, all, I'm multicultural. I love all, all, you know, all kinds of music. But it made me become almost to the point where once upon a time, I was like, you know what? I won't date anybody that's my complexion or life. Mm. Just because I was trying to validate my blackness, blackish. Yeah. You know, right. and so it just got to the point where once I grew up and realized what was really going on and changed my mindset, man, I don't care if you go in the dark, if you translucent and I can see or transparent, I don't care. Now it's about your heart and your mind and what you believe in, you know, what you stand on. It's not about what you look like on the outside because I, in one of my books, I call it cheesesteak love. You know, mm -hmm. you get a cheesesteak, the wrapper is all greasy, falling apart, the meat falling out. But when you bite into that sandwich, that is the best sandwich you have ever had in your life. So right. I just challenge people to get past the rapper and really <laughs> see who people are today. And I think we're going to be all right. But it's going to take you know, some time, but we're going to be all right. Absolutely. And I, and I know it's kind of one of those difficult conversations to have, like, um, you know, people who have maybe, you know, black, uh, you know, who are mo uh, mixed race. They have a you know white mother or a white father like those conversations. I mean, and I'm sure that they get it because they're with someone's black. They have to kind of understand the culture to even understand the person that you're with. But understanding that that when these situations happen, that things begin to look differently, and the conversations are had that are differently because they may have a person in their family that's racist or whatever. And it's like you know that's the that's the tricky thing. It's like when you you know dating multi different races, like you may have somebody who actually okay with what's happening or okay with, with you know. So it's like but they have to be at a place to where they can combat that. They can be like, you know what, that's not right. That's not the right way of thinking and kind of remove themselves from that situation. 
But that's one of those things that is that, you know, African-American is you go to if you're dating someone, uh, you know, who's maybe white or um, another race that you may have to go to those things of being even someone being racist towards you in a current family you married into. Mm -hmm. So that's another situation. It's funny you say that because my nephew is black and white and he lives in Nebraska with my brother who went to Roosevelt from Fairmont Heights who went to college in Nebraska and just stayed out there. Okay. Right. When we first met, and this will be real quick, because I know you write it, go do some stuff. But when we went out there for the first time, my brother's baby mama, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be ignorant for a second, mm -hmm. baby mama's sister, I was walking down the sidewalk and she just bumps me. Mm. And so I'm like, you're not going to say excuse me? For what? Girl, if I wasn't in Nebraska, I'm telling you, because I was fearful of if they call the police in Nebraska, I might not go home. Yeah. And then the flip side is I listen to how they talk to my brother. We call my brother Tommy. Right. His name is Thomas. They go, Thomas, go get the laundry. Thomas, go do this. And I was like, Thomas, if you don't get a backbone, what is wrong with you? You the man, first of all, whether you black, white, and different, you're a man. She should right. not be having this much control over you. She told him that if he didn't put a ring on her finger by the time the baby was born, he would never see his son. I mm. said, who? I said, try it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So here I am. I'm considered aggressive because I speak up, because I spoke yeah. back up to that family. Whereas now they're no longer together. And I'm kind of I'm kind of in between because that's my nephew. But my whole point was having to explain this to AJ, my nephew, what's going on, you know, and having him still feel confident and have pride in both sides, his black side and his white side, and know that he's a human being. It doesn't matter what he looks like. You know, it's, it's all about his heart and who he is. And so it's just important that we keep having these discussions and getting the word out. And like I said, I haven't been out to protest just because of number one COVID and I had some back issues, but I'm still on the inside. I'm still sharing information. I'm still doing what we gotta do. So. As long as we keep it open and keep doing what we gotta do, we are gonna be all right. It might not come today, it might not come tomorrow, but it's we gonna be all right. Absolutely. All right, for real this time, big brother. All right. Thank all right, you. I got you. All right, baby, call me if you need me. I'll be sure later. All right, later. Tell Kelly I said hi too. We'll do. Later.